It was over. Give, give, give them both a ticket. Live large. I would give also like to uh, introduce today we have Marco Polo. He's the representative for Pete Aguilar here this morning. Woo. to all of our first time visitors. Great to have you here. And uh, we were at family asked that you, after the meeting, introduce yourself to our first time guests and make them feel welcome. But don't forget, you can still get in that raffle pot. You may not have gotten a free ticket, but only like a dollar each. Get in it, $625 at the end of the meeting. That's a 50-50 pot, which means we also have $625 to give away to a local charity so far. And this is a progressive raffle that keeps growing. So thank you again for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you have all had an opportunity to grab some breakfast. Are you enjoying your breakfast this morning? Dave always enjoys it, and I appreciate Dave. And uh, thank you guys. You know, this breakfast is brought to us each week by our breakfast sponsors, which are our affiliates. We are so grateful for our affiliates and all that they do for the West End real estate professionals. Let's see the hands of our affiliates in the room. We want to say thank you to you all affiliates. Let me see your hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. You support our events. You support us through breakfast. But today, our breakfast sponsor is, with clear sinking, staging, and design and decor, Lucia Robles. Everybody say good morning to Lucia. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I love we have so many first time visitors here, and we have a full house. So, happy Friday. I hope you're enjoying the breakfast. Um, did you wanna? Yep. Oh, okay. So, oh, go back. Go back. <laughs> so, together with my daughter, Julie, uh, we both, it's a mother-daughter staging company. We're local, but we also stage Orange County, LA County, Riverside County. Okay, so just to let you know. Next slide. So, a picture's worth a thousand words. I just wanted to show you some of our work and what we do. Uh, how many of you would agree that staging makes a difference? Yeah, almost everybody. Absolutely. So can you believe this is the same room? A little bit of paint, changed out some of the uh, seller's furniture, and that really, that house, it, it sold, and people were very excited about it, everybody that came to see it. <laughs> um, we create custom designs, so we do everything from traditional to contemporary to modern. It just depends on the architectural features of the home. And sometimes we have to work with the seller's furniture, as was the case in um, the, the after picture here. The seller had this old Victorian style furniture. We did ask them to remove everything from the living room, but we had to work to um, complement what they had going on in the bedrooms, which was Victorian furniture as well. But it all came out very nicely. Uh, we also, sometimes you go into a house and the budget doesn't allow for a full staging. So we, um, we have to make sense of the room. And as you can see in this condominium, there really was no flow to the room. So we just came in, did some space planning, redesigned the room, brought in a sectional, a mirror and all the accessories, and that's basically all we did there. It made a huge difference. So thank you for having me today, and I'll be around after if anybody wants to come and introduce themselves, and thank you again for the opportunity. to be a breakfast sponsor here at the West End Real Estate Professionals as well. We need and appreciate your support, so if you want to, you can see myself or see our breakfast sponsorship chairperson, Jose. He is in the back of the room taking pictures. Give us your business card. We'll set up a date and time. It's your only opportunity to place your marketing materials on all of the tables. We also add your logo and contact information in our email blast throughout the entire week. It goes out to thousands of real estate professionals. It's a great opportunity for a small investment. See me after the meeting, see Jose, and we'll get you set up for a future date. Um, I believe we have some coming up in June that we can get you guys on for, and we do appreciate your support. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to talk about our next great event that is just a number of weeks away. We're going to have a lot of fun at this event. I'd like to have our event chairperson and his party planning committee to come up and tell us about the Cinco de Mayo, May the 4th, Revenge of the 5th event that's happening in just a few weeks on May 4th. Yay! Keep it brief, uh, but we also definitely want to recognize uh, all the sponsors. That
that are helping us out. Uh, Modern Woodman, uh, they were the breakfast sponsor last week, so they are also doing the biggest package for us, so we really want to thank them. Uh, Guards of LA, uh, these are the two uh, big sponsorships that are helping us put this event together. The Laker girls will be there. We do have a live mariachi. Citrus Valley Association of Realtors is a sponsor, thank you for that. Alvarado Master Agency, Edelwanda Roadhouse, Guaranteed Rate, Quality Real Estate, Integrity Home Finance, Kevin, Illinois Empire Escrow, you guys always support everything, of course. Uh, Farmers Insurance, Believer Media, Remax Champions, Inland Valley Association of Realtors, Jonathan Perea uh, with Century 21 King, Elite Barbershop, Adam Tice, Change Home Mortgage. You guys all know these people, by the way, so you guys give them business, they're supporting us and they're helping us give back. Gem Mortgage, that's Thomas Lizignow, Luis Vasquez, PRMG, House Parties in the 90s, Remax Home Realty, Rancho Capital Home Loans, uh, Danny. There you go, thank you, sir. Uh, Main Street Realtors, Wilson and Bell Auto Repair. My friend right here with Comparian, there you go. Uh, MBM Credit Solutions, Diego, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna try to read this one. Diamond Country Escrow Pan. Oh, there, of course, obviously. And CNXN LLC. Um, and there's a lot more coming in. Today is the last day to pay for your sponsorship, to get your banners, to get on the flyers, to get the recognition. Um, it's going to be a packed house. You guys can see all of the sponsors that we have. I'm gonna have my friend here tell you guys a little bit about the charity. Um, so thank you guys. Hello everybody. Thank you for everybody who's sponsored so far. Um, so again, this is my first event here. I can't remember the last time I did the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I kind of, I was listening to George and kind of like, but I thought what was interesting was, uh, it kind of reminded me of like, maybe your first day at school, right? And then like, if you were to remember your first day of school and like showing up, like what were the things you were thinking about? For me, it wasn't like, hey, do I have my backpack? Do I have a pencil to write like notes with? You know, so I feel super blessed to have like the upbringing that I have to not have to worry about those things. And I feel like we're all possibly in a position to help out these kids uh, because the, the point of this event is to help out um, kids at Chafee High School uh, get backpacks and other school equipment so that, um, you know, that's not one thing that they have to worry about this year. So uh, we're helping out displaced and homeless kids at Chafee High School. So uh, if you feel called to sponsor, today's the last day. Thank you. talk to the uh, venue, they are able to do um, the senior sit and accommodate uh, basically bottle service if you guys want to do that. So there you go. And we're also looking for uh, raffle prizes. So if you're anyone that wants to donate a raffle prize, uh, just get a set of this now. 
Thank you guys. One last thing. Oh. One of the easiest ways that you guys can support us is to share a post if you see it on any of the social media platforms. Repost it, share it, try to get as many people aware of this great event that we're trying to hold as well. Thank you, George. And the party planning committee, we appreciate it. Hey, if you want to get more involved, you can see George at the meeting and become part of the party planning committee. And uh, hey, thank you for all of our sponsors supporting this event. It's like $25 to buy a ticket if you just want to come as an individual and you get a taco and you get a taco plate. Actually, we had an event there, it was phenomenal. Full taco plate, a beer, a drink, a great time. Like you said, the Laker girls are going to be there, uh, full band. It's going to be a great time to DJ. So get in it. We're going to have a lot of fun on May 4th. You can find out more information about anything that I've said on our website at weref.org. All right, moving on to our guest speaker. We're so excited to have him today. Uh, this is one of my favorite presentations of the year. We love having Randall Lewis out, but I love having today's guest speaker out as well. Yes, sir. I just want to say we got chairs coming. So and if you have a chair available at your table, maybe you can raise your hand. We've got a chair down front. I don't know if there are any others. No, just one chair down front. All right. Yeah, that's it. Just the one. So act fast. And we have more chairs coming out, so thank you all for being here. All right, I'd like to tell you a little bit about today's guest speaker. Mr. Dan H. Bowman has served as President, Chief Executive Officer and Director of Chino Commercial Bank N.A. and of Chino Commercial Bank Corp. since their formations in 2000 and 2006, respectively. He wrote the business plan for the bank with its opening in September of 2000. Mr. Bowman has been a commercial banker since 1983. As an active member of the local community, he has been a member of the Kiwanis Club for over 25 years and served on the Board of Trustees of San Antonio Community Hospital in Upland, California from 2008 to the end of 2013. Mr. Bowman also served on the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco from 2007 to 2011. He was previously an active member of the Inland Empire Chapter of Risk Management Association, RMA, formerly known as the Robert Morris Associates, an organization dedicated to the enhancement of the banking and thrift industry through the provisions of education, financial analysts, did I get that right? Yeah. Analysis, sorry, and networking opportunities to its members. Mr. Bowman served on the board of the local RMA for five years and is the past chairman of the American Red Cross in the Valley chapter. He's also a graduate of California State University, San Bernardino. Mr. Bowman is not only a banker, but also a builder. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he personally built and installed all of the plexiglasses, shields around the Tiller area, for the entire bank. He is also an avid cyclist, nice. riding a bicycle all the way across the United States, west to east and south to north. Dan has been married for 33 years to Trish Bowman and has three boys. He has done an amazing job guiding Chino Commercial Bank for the last 23 years, especially through economically challenging times like we see today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for the President and CEO of Chino Commercial Bank, Mr. Dan Bowman. because it's not going to get any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, you know, when somebody reads this stuff about you, it's like, dang, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> My answer would have been, not damn, thanks. <laughs> it's, uh, it's true, we rode our bikes across the United States, uh, both from the Pacific to the Atlantic and Mexico to Canada. Imagine what I could have done if I owned a car. <laughs> Well, let's see, I've got 35 minutes to explain the current state of the banking industry and the economy. Um, I should have time left over at the end, so uh, I'm gonna have to move pretty quickly, so I apologize for that in advance. So, everyone has heard the news, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, Silvergate Bank, uh, First Republic Bank, Credit Suisse, and uh, things are blowing up and there's a lot of fear and misunderstanding. And then if you turn on Fox News or CNN or NBC, there's always an expert. That expert that can define in one sentence an entire industry. 
the ones I like the best, you know, I get up in the morning and I ride the stationary bike now, and uh, I turn on the news, and some guys, you know, all small banks are going to fail. Well, thank you very much, you know. There's 4,300 banks in the United States, not even counting credit unions, and you can define them all in one sentence. That's pretty good. Well, anyway, so this morning let's talk about Silicon Valley because each one of these has got a different story to it. So let's just focus for a second on Silicon Valley. And let's start off talking about the primary risks of banking. The thing that hurts banks primarily is credit risk. You write bad loans. You write bad loans, people don't pay you back, you charge it off your capital, pretty soon you run out of capital, and then you're in trouble. Uh, that didn't happen to Silicon Valley Bank. Their credit quality was really very good. Um, interest rate risk. Well, now we're starting to get closer to the Silicon Valley issue. And then most importantly is liquidity risk. Now, liquidity is uh, banks take deposits or they borrow from their customers overnight. And then they make loans for long periods of time. And in between is liquidity. And that's what hurt Silicon Valley. They had too many people show up at the telephone line at the same time saying, I'd like to get my money back, please. And it turned out it was about $150 billion over two days. Uh, pretty excited. So let's, let's get really geeky here. I know you guys are anxious to get into bank balance sheet allocations on a Friday morning. So uh, I love this stuff. <laughs> so this, this is a typical bank. Uh, in a typical bank, about 80% of your total assets, sometimes clear up to 100% of your total assets, are invested in loans to your customers. But 80% is a kind of a good spot. About 10% are investments, mortgage-backed securities, treasuries, that sort of thing. Uh, and then you've got around 6% in, in fixed assets, tables, chairs, desks, etc., some cash and some other things. Well. All right, fine. The key thing to take away from this is about 10% in investments, okay? So now we'll get even geekier. I know if you, if you love balance sheet allocation, you're gonna love bond investing. So this is an example of, of bond investing valuation. And so a bond is a contract, as we know, and it has a defined term. So in this example we're throwing out here, it's this bond pays $2,000 a year for a certain number and then if we use a 2% return objective, that would equate to about $100,000 in this example, right? Okay, fine, life is good, and I'm using round numbers just for simplicity. But let's just say hypothetically interest rates go up to 2.5. Now what is that bond worth? Well, at a 2.5 minimum yield, now it's only worth 80,000 it decreases in value. So they move in opposite direction. When interest rates go up, bond valuations go down. Okay. I know this, you guys already know this stuff, so anyway. <laughs> so in this example, it's a 20% volatility that we're looking at here, right? 20% volatility of 50 bips or 50 basis points. So, all right, we'll get even geek here. Now accounting, you got two different ways of accounting this. It's either hold to maturity or available for sale. So think about hold to maturity as the way I look at my house. I live in it. I don't, you know, I pay attention. Maybe there's some flyers on a neighbor's house, and I, I go over there and look at it and see how much they're asking for it, that sort of thing. But it's just kind of amusing to me. I'm not really focused on it. I don't have to accomplish, you know, values going up or down. Alternatively, think about available for sale as somebody maybe has a listing and they're wanting to market their house. Now value is important. Now up and down becomes real and it's tangible. So uh, there are two methods of accounting for bonds, hold maturity and available for sale. Available for sale, you've got to publish when that rate changed. Just kind of like when you had a listing and you drop the price. You tell the world, I was gonna get 100 before, now I'm gonna get 95. And uh, so in available for sale, that's the way banks have to publish it. You have to come out quarterly and say, my bond that I paid 100 for is now worth 80. Important point there. So again, going back to this 20% volatility on you know, 10% of assets, well, that's only 2% on total assets. 
Okay, 2%, I can survive a 2% shock. That won't kill me too bad. But the key is it's 10% uh, investments. If we look additionally at assets in a bank, about 90% are assets, about 10% is capital. So think about assets are things that I own, that I bought. Capital is my money, the money that I threw in the pot. And it's usually around 10%. So again, 2% volatility on total assets, 10% capital means a 20% volatility on capital. All right, okay, it's starting to, I'm, I'm getting it here. Bottom line is, it's manageable, okay. But if that value, or the interest rates go up, as I mentioned, we get a decrease in valuation, I've got a 20% valuation adjustment. My capital, which was 10% before, now turns into 8% capital. Okay, all right, I, I'm still in business. Yeah, I don't like it, but I'm still in business, okay. All right, so let's hold that one aside and look. Now, this is the Federal Reserve Economic Department, Economic Data. That's what Fred's about. Fred's not a person. Fred's an acronym. And uh, so this is Federal Reserve numbers, and these are total Federal Reserve assets. And we can see here that uh, going up to about 2009, the Federal Reserve had less than a trillion dollars in total assets, 893 billion. And in 2009, Ed Bernanke figured out, shoot, I got a checkbook for this. Man, I can, I can make money. And he did. And he bumped it from about a trillion to two trillion right off the bat. And then he continued to ramp things up beyond that. In 2019, we're already up to 3.7 trillion dollars. 370 percent increase where we had been for many years. So wait a minute, wait, you know, we look at this whole period, 2013 through 2019, I was there then. Those were pretty good times. Why did we keep expanding the balance sheet during that time? Well, we'll see in a minute, it's, it's problematic for us. And then if we go to the pandemic, there were no rules. There were no constraints, there was no debate. Nobody was saying, should we really expand the monetary base. We were also afraid of contracting COVID and that sort of thing. We didn't care about those. The monetary base, and, the, and when I say monetary base, I'm talking about the total dollars in the economy. Total dollars jumped up in that one step in two years from 3.7 trillion to 8.9 trillion. It's a 5.2 trillion or 140% increase in the number of dollars. So think about it, we've got a monopoly board around the table and we've got $100 in total and somebody throws in another 140 on top of it. So now there's 240. What's gonna happen to the price of Park Place? Oh, and that's gonna go up because you can. If we look at total bank deposits, bank deposits went up similar to the expansion of balance sheet. We can see there beginning in in uh, the first quarter of 2000, a pretty big jump. And uh, we went from about 13 trillion in bank assets to 18 trillion. And that was uh, about a $5 trillion increase, 38% in total bank deposits. So as a banker, I wasn't complaining. We had a 42% increase in deposits in 2020. Uh, now I was worried about COVID. And by the way, I'm having a sale on lightly used plexiglass sneeze guards. <laughs> What do you do with those things when you're done with them? You know. Anyway, so bank deposits went up dramatically. When I say a 42% increase in deposits in the banking industry, you don't see 42% anything. Uh, you see a 3% or a, a very small move. And so that much of an increase that fast was really significant. And it wasn't just our bank, it was all banks. And as a net result, that balance sheet, remember that used to be around 1% in cash? That turned into 33% in cash. Their banks had so much cash laying around, and everybody knows that, because you'd call them, you'd say, what's your interest rate on a savings account? And they'd laugh at you and hang up. Uh, 
it was low. You know, CD. I, I remember, I, you know, because we look at other banks. What are they doing? And B of A was paying one big, a 12 month CD. One one hundredth of one percent on a 12 month CD. Gosh, I mean, you know. At any rate, so banks were washing cash. And cash is not good because it doesn't earn you anything. We're in the business of renting money. And cash is not good because nobody rents it. So you got to put it to work. And eventually, because the Federal Reserve kept saying, inflation is transitory, it's a stable environment, uh, life is good, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And so eventually, banks took that cash and invested it into investments. Right? Think of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Now, treasuries, those are full faith and credit of the U.S. government. You can't get any safer than that. So this is a, a very secure investment. And so we look at something like Silicon Valley Bank, they put 56% of their total balance sheet into U.S. Treasuries. 56%. The problem is, remember that 20% volatility we looked at early on? At 56%, in this case, that's $117 billion. $117 billion with a B. 20% volatility equals an 11.2% decrease in total assets. Okay, well, remember that 10% capital? If I reduce that by 11.2, I've got a negative number. Silicon Valley Bank had what's called a negative tangible net equity, right? So you add up all your assets, you add up all your liabilities, and it's a negative number. Well, but a lot of it was in hold to maturity. Good, because I don't have to release that, remember? And the problem is they also had a very narrow depositor base. This was, these were tech companies. Uh, their largest depositor had $10 billion on deposit. If I had a depositor with $10 billion, I would get up every morning, give them a call, say, what can I do for you today? <laughs> Anybody remember the Beverly Hillbillies? <laughs> Mr. Drysdale? That would be me. Yes, what can I do? Uh, just for fear that, you know, Wells Fargo's going to call him and want to take him to lunch. And so, at any rate, that was Roku, the, uh, the online streaming service. $10 billion. So it was a narrow depositor base. And these, by the way, are actual tweets amongst their shareholder. Hashtag plan to sell. Oh, that's never a good hashtag. SIVB, that's the ticker symbol for Silicon Valley Bank. Hold of maturity securities had marked to market losses in third quarter of 15.9 billion, compared with just 11.5 billion of tangible common equity. Luckily, the regulators do not force Silicon Valley to mark hold of maturity securities to market, but the bank would be functionally underwater if it were liquidated today. That was January 18th. This is one of their shareholders talking to another shareholder about how deep this bank is in trouble. And unfortunately, they were pretty well connected. Now, if we look at the Fed funds rate, again, let's put a pin in that. Let's look at the Fed funds rate. Uh, and we can see, uh, this is Federal Reserve controls the Fed funds rate, by the way. That's when Jerome Powell comes in on typically on Wednesday. He says, yeah, we all got together and we decided we're going to raise interest rates. And historically, the Fed funds rate has been adjusted at about one quarter of 1%, 25 bits is what we call it. And you do that over a period of time, and that's fine. Well, first Janet Yellen, my ex-friend, said, uh, <laughs> I worked with Janet at the Federal Reserve in San Francisco. But uh, she comes up, she says, uh, interest rates are transitory. Don't worry about it, it's not a problem. And then Jerome Powell comes out and says, oh shoot, they are a problem, pay attention to it. And we started increasing interest rates at 75 bips per. So it was rising at three times the speed that anyone expected. And we can see we went from uh, seven years of zero interest rates just before the pandemic, we're at eight one hundredths of 1% on the Fed funds rate. And in just 13 months, 
we increased almost 500 basis points. That, by the way, is the fastest the Federal Reserve has increased the Fed funds rate ever. And nobody was prepared for that. You know, we, we plan these things, we look, we test, we stress, and we say, we used to say up and down 300. Let's look at how our interest rate risk is up and down 300. And then we got bold and said, now nah, let's do it up and down 400. Let's really be crazy. Nobody planned on up and down 500. And that's what happened. So Silicon Valley Bank had a volatile customer base, people that talked to each other, and big, big, big deposits. Abnormally high percentage of fixed income securities, 58% of their total assets, those were those bonds, remember? Now they were secure, the U.S. Treasuries, there's no doubt they're secure. The problem is the mark-to-market adjustment on those. Very large deposits, 97% of their deposits exceeded FDIC limits. That means only 3% were within that $250,000 number. All of the others were above that number. And well-connected depositor base, these guys talk to each other. What could possibly go wrong with that one? <laughs> and then finally, to cap it all off, rapidly rising interest rates, and it killed them. So what, what happened there? Uh, Friday, and, and by the way, I used to sit next to the president of Silicon Valley when I was at the Fed. Great guy. He retired about five years ago, so he isn't at the bank today because he wouldn't be happy about this. But, you know, if I had to make a list of banks that are going to hit the rocks, this wouldn't have been on the list. So, fundamentally not a bad bank, but Friday they blew up, and then Sunday, Signature Bank was seized. Nobody gets seized on a Sunday. You gotta, how do you call them? Excuse me, I'm in church. You want me to what? <laughs> that, that was interesting. So, Friday, Silicon Valley Bank, Sunday, Signature Bank. Signature had to do with crypto, and a lot of issues there, but still some of the same fundamentals. Well, Tuesday morning, uh, number one, Janet comes out Monday and says, well, we're gonna cover the depositors of Silicon Valley Bank because they're systemically important. What she didn't say is, if you were the little bank, we're not gonna cover you. So, not happy about that. At any rate, it caused a lot of uncertainty in the market. Uh, but then Tuesday, the Federal Reserve came out with what's called the fixed income, what do they call that darn thing? Um, oh, bank term funding program. That's a complicated word. But anyway, bank term funding program. An important thing about this is a bank can borrow 100% of par values. So remember that example I did on the bond where I bought it for 100 and I became worth 80? Well, under this program, I can borrow 100 of them. Dude, all right. So now I can offset that mark-to-market adjustment. Fixed interest rate for 12 months, no prepay. Uh, overnight rate is uh, the swap index plus 10 bips. This is cheap money. Um, recent transaction we did, 4.37% fixed for 12. By relative terms, that's pretty cheap money. The important thing is this was released on Tuesday after Silicon Valley was seized on Friday. If this were in place, Silicon Valley could have borrowed $190 billion and could have covered their liquidity issue. Oh, it was that close. So, at any rate, that's the, what they could have borrowed, about $190 million. So, that's what happened to Silicon Valley. Uh, is it a contagion? Is it an issue? Uh, for those guys on Fox News saying, you know, crazy bankers taking unreasonable risk. Uh, maybe they did. Maybe they took unreasonable risk because they thought the federal government would take a more um, uh, staged approach to interest rate adjustments instead of 75 bips per. In any event, um, again, with the new program, uh, Silicon Valley could have survived this. And we can also talk about Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse is a whole different equation. That is the second largest bank in Switzerland, $660 billion. And Switzerland's a country with a lot of banks. Uh, $660 billion. The problem with Credit Suisse is credit quality. It's not interest rate risk, it's credit quality. 
And you can't fix credit quality. You really got to take them over and break them up and you know sell off the parts. Um, you can't rehab management and that sort of thing. Credit quality is really tough. So let's touch on inflation in the next 14 minutes. And um, and you know what do we expect going forward? Is inflation going to be an issue or is it not going to be an issue? Despite what my friend Janet says, inflation is not transitory. Inflation is here. Uh, this is, again, Federal Reserve Economic Data, and this is looking at what's called M2. There's M1, M2, and M3. M2 is money in savings accounts, checking accounts, CDs, and money accounts. And we can see here, at the beginning of the pandemic, we're at 15 trillion in M2, which jumped up to 22 trillion in M2, so a wash in cash. It's a 46% increase in a short period of time. We'll look at core CPI. During that same period of time, now CPI is the Consumer Price Index. But what you do is you, you baseline it. So you, you look at a basket of goods and services and you put a dollar amount to it and you assign it 100. And then you look at it, does it go up? Does it become 101, 102, 103, or does it become 99? So the CPI, and this is core CPI, by the way, you take food and fuel out of this because they're too volatile. So core CPI is up 6.61% at the same time that we've flooded the market with liquidity. So, all right, I don't think you have to be a Rhodes Scholar to say if you dump a lot of cash into the economy, prices are going to go up, and that's what's happening. Total federal debt. Um, now then, how many people remember 1983? Uh, I, had a, uh, I had a night school class in 1983. I think it was accounting or econ, I don't know. It's one of those things where you work all day at work and then you go to a class and it was uh, eight o'clock to 10 o'clock or something. I am dying. But we'd take a break in the middle and you'd go get a little coffee cup that had playing cards on it. Kind of syrupy stuff. It was 100% caffeine. And uh, I'm standing around these guys talking during the breakout session. The one guy said, uh, So this past weekend, uh, my wife and I went out, we made an offer, and we bought the house. Oh, great, good, congratulations. That's terrific. You know, where is it? Oh, it's on the corner of X and Y. Oh, I know that project. That's very nice. Those are great houses. That's terrific, you know, we're, we're being encouraging. And then one of the guys says, uh, were you locked in on your mortgage finance? And he said, we were. We got locked in at 17%. <laughs> and everybody else said, ooh, that's good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay, that was tough. So, are we going to see that again? Are we going to see 17% mortgage rates? And I think no. I don't think we'll see 17% mortgage rates. And the reason is, so this is total federal debt. Um, 23 trillion at the beginning of the recession, it went up to 31 trillion uh, during that period of time, 52% in total debt. So then the question is, Real rate adjustment. Okay, so you may hear the word real rate, real rate of return or real rate of cost. What real is referring to is the amount over inflation. Okay, so think about it. If, if the inflation rate were 6.4%, and that's what the Fed says it is, and I land money at less than 6.4%, it means I'm losing money. So let's just say hypothetically, current 30 year fixed rate mortgage is 6.27%. That's the average nationwide. Okay. And then I tax adjust that, right? Because I get a deduction on that interest rate. It means my net cost is 4.07%. So, okay, my cost of financing is 4%, but the asset is increasing at 6.4%. I'm getting paid to borrow money. That's a pretty big deal, and that's what we're doing. 
On the other hand, if you take a, the current inflation rate, 6.4, and we assume you should get about a 2% rate of return before you talk about credit risk. So a 2% rate of return, tax adjusted rate using a 35% tax rate. It means an interest rate today should be about 12.92%. Of course, if I were sitting out there, I'd think, well, I hope that doesn't catch on because that's a lot. Well, that's the math. So let's go the other way and say, oh, wait a minute, 12.92, that doesn't make sense to me. It sounds too high. Once I tax adjust it, it means my after tax cost of financing 8.4%. Inflation is 6.4%, it's a plus two. All right, so that's where interest rates should be. So why are we still at such a low rate? Why are we still doing this this way? Why are we creating an incentive to borrow? Historical Fed funds rate. Uh, again, 1983, I'm in ninth school class, living on coffee, trying to stay awake. And at that time, inflation peaked at 18%. Remember 1983, AMC, Gremlin? That's a car for you. I, I was driving a, uh, a Vega. Vega was engineered obsolescence. It was designed to go a certain number of miles and die. <laughs> the guy I bought it from had driven those miles. So. <laughs> A Pinto, it's close counterpart. I think if you still got a Pinto, it's probably worth some money these days. We don't want to drive it, but it's worth something. So, inflation back in 1983, 18%. And where was Fed funds? 22%. Remember, interest rates have to be higher than inflation, otherwise, it creates an embedded motivation to borrow. So that's an example where we saw 22% Fed funds rates, 19% mortgage rates, et cetera. Um, now also we had the oil embargo and a whole bunch of stuff in, in Vegas that fell apart, but it was good for the parts business. Um, and we can see, by the way, the vertical gray lines here are periods of recession. So we can see the Federal Reserve increases interest rates. We had a recession. Things slow down, interest rates go back down, we repeat and recycle. So this same chart, if we look at it in, in a different scale, we can see the frequency of the Federal Reserve raising rates, then the recession. Well, what else do we see about this? We see that the peaks are going down. Okay, all right. So what does that tell us? It tells us we don't have to raise interest rates very much before the economy breaks and we go into recession. At one time we had to go up 22%. Now we go up 2.5% and the wheels are falling off. <laughs> if we look at historical CPI again, what else do we notice? Similar curve. So CPI is lower, interest rates are lower. Right up until this time. So we see that breakout in CPI. Going all back to 1983, we've got this smooth decreasing curve. Interest rates are getting lower, CPI is getting lower, everything's trailing down right up until this recent trend. And that's a big difference. So the question is, are we gonna to go to 12.92% interest? As I suggest we should, and I don't believe we will. Why don't I think we will? Is because if we look at total debt, again in 1983, back when I'm in, in night school, we had total debt, total public Federal Reserve debt, uh, federal government debt, of $1.3 trillion. Okay, not too bad. Today, our total federal debt, $31.4 trillion. So think of it like if, uh, if I owed you um, $50 and you said, Dan, I'm gonna charge you 20% interest. All right, fine, whatever, that's 10 bucks. It's not the end of the world. On the other hand, if I owe you 50 million and you change the interest rate a very small amount, pretty soon I can't afford it. And that's the position we're in today. 
So the, the US dollar, uh, so in conclusion, um, 